All right, well, for those of you who don't know me, I'd be surprised because I've been around here for a very long time, <laughs> and uh, there aren't too many Asians, so pretty easy to spot. Um, but I'm Josh, and uh, <laughs> Pastor Jeff and Karen, our lead and senior pastors, they are ministering out in Brazil, so they're not with us today, uh, but they surely wish they could be, but they are out and about doing amazing things. And so if you think about them, pray for them while they're out. Uh, But for this morning, I have the privilege to bring you uh, continuing on our series that we're doing. Um, So I'm going to begin with a story. I feel like I don't need to say that. But anyways, here's the story. High school uh, summer break was the first Sunday I remember not going to church. I know. Shocker. You guys are thinking, why is he even standing up here? This sinner. So in high school, I remember um, my, my good friend at the time, they had, their family was going camping and they invited me to go camping with them. But the problem was it went from, you know, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, which was just unheard of in my life at the time. And so I was like, okay, well, I would love to go camping. I enjoy camping. Uh, so I, I wanted to go. So I was preparing to ask my parents how this was going to work. A uh, little bit of backstory. Growing up, we always went to church on Sundays. Uh, I don't know if it was spiritually good or legalistic, just the fact is we always were there. It was never a question of if we were going, it was always when, right? So if we didn't make it for the morning one, we went to an evening service somewhere, right? Like we always, like Sundays was, was church, and so that was how I grew up. And so I was like, this camping opportunity, that conflicts with that. And so I remember preparing sort of like a speech for my parents being like, hey, I would really like to go camping. It'd be really great. You know, maybe I threw in something about evangelizing to my friend. I don't know. But I was like, (laughs) in the morning, I will like, you know, I'm going to pray. I'm going to read the Bible. I might sing some songs to myself because Jesus likes that. Uh, So I I was like, I I was preparing that. I go and ask my my mom and I was like, hey, can I go camping? She's like, fine. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow. Well, that was easy. So so I didn't even have to make the promises, but I did. I was like, well, just so you know, I'm going to pray in the morning. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to sing. Like, I'm going to do that. She's like, yeah, cool. That's, yeah, go have fun. I'm like, yeah, great. All right. So we went camping with my friends, had a great time. Sunday morning, did about half of what I said I was going to do. Um, And then we came back. I was like, Caught, no one caught that? Okay, good. I'm free. Uh, and so going on that camping trip, first weekend ever not going, I could remember not going to church on a Sunday. And my eyes were open to the possibility of a three-day weekend. I was amazed. And I thought to myself, even Jesus rested for three days. I had a great weekend. I did. But, but something felt off. I remember this, and the following week felt wrong. It took way too long for Sunday to come back. And I didn't feel guilty, per se, but I noticed that I felt empty. Now, I'm not saying that if you skip a Sunday and that's not your experience, that you're, you're you know, a sinner. You know, you go have a week and you're like, oh, I feel totally fine. I'm not saying you're bad, okay? I'm just saying I'm better than you. That's all. <laughs> That is why I'm standing up here. No, I'm kidding. Uh, But even as a kid, I realized that there was a value in in prioritizing the regular Sunday gathering. There was an intentionality to it, and I felt that intentionality missing when I skipped it. So we're continuing our series on the church, and uh, the series called Belong. And and this morning, I want to talk about the gathering, which is what we do. So all of you can put a gold star on your star sheet. I don't, I don't know what do we do these days. Uh, but you earned a gold star today because you are already practicing the sermon before the sermon began. That's great. I want to talk to you about why regular local gatherings should be, an, be essential to your rhythm as a believer. Why regular local gatherings should be essential as your rhythm as believers. To begin, I want to talk about the meaning of the word church. Okay. The people who name kitchen appliances are either very considerate or very lazy. Have you noticed this? Toaster, refrigerator, blender. Oh, what does it do? Just add er, you got the name. Right? They're very lazy. It's very simple. It's nice. It's convenient. 
Uh, steamer, rice cooker, deep fryer, waffle maker, right? This is a job that you could hire me to do. This is great. <laughs> What's that? It slices things up. It's a slicer. <laughs> I'm already a pro. Promote me, right? So <laughs> it's convenient. The, the, the action is written within the name. Did you know that that is actually the same with the word church? The name tells us what it does. We are the church, right? So obviously, we, 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 we church. That's, that's, we, we churching. Like, that's what we do. Uh, okay, it's confusing because church is our English translation. But, it, but we tra when we translate this from the Bible, it comes from uh, two Greek and Hebrew words. And both of these words imply a gathering of people. So when, we, when you read the word church in the Bible, it is a word that says a gathering of people. So when we call ourselves the church, when we talk about being the church, which is what believers are, we are saying we are those who gather. In essence, the word is an activity that defines the identity. The word is an activity and it defines who we are. Being the church is like saying, I am a juggler. Right? If I tell you that I am a juggler, what am I implying? That I can juggle. I cannot juggle. I can barely catch, and I certainly can't throw. I can barely walk and drink water at the same time. Multitasking is not my thing, right? So I, 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 I in all honesty, I do not juggle. But if I, if I don't juggle and I say I'm a juggler, like, it's inconsistent. What does that say about us then? If we're willing to say, yeah, I'm a believer, I'm part of the church. Saying I'm a Christian, which means you're a person who is a part of the church, is essentially saying, I am a gatherer. <laughs> I am a part of those who gather. That becomes an interesting title if that's not a priority of yours. So within the very nature, the meaning of the word church. Why are regular local gatherings essential for believers? It's because it is who we are. It's who we are. Next I have is the make of the church. I have, just, just so you guys know, I have five points so you can, you know, time me and know where we are because I like to know how fast it's going to end too. So there are five points, don't worry. The make of the church yeah, too many. Yeah, that's too, too many. I heard that. All right. <laughs> you, can, you can leave at three. The make of the church. The church is not a building. It's not a place. It's not even just a service. We use that word that way because it defines the location and the manner in which we gather. But those things cannot be those who gather, right? The church is the people. We are the church. The church is defined as all believers in Jesus Christ throughout all time, and it finds its expression in regular local gatherings. There is a face to the church, and it is this. It is this all over the world. Followers of Jesus Christ who derive their identity and mission from Jesus. There is something that is important to understand about the church. You are not the church. We are the church. You yourself cannot make the church just as I myself cannot be a family. I require other people. So we become the church with others. You yourself are not the church. We are the church. See, when you become a believer, you as an individual must believe. Right? Nobody can believe for you, but you as an individual, you are now placed into the corporate. A follower of Jesus in isolation, this is, this is going to be a little gross, but it's kind of how the Bible puts it. A follower of Jesus living in isolation is essentially like saying, I want to have a relationship with a decapitated head. Right? I want Jesus, but I don't want the body. That's weird. That's creepy. We'll probably get arrested. On the flip side, sorry, that was too much. <laughs> On the flip side, this thing that we belong to, you'll experience this if you travel or when you travel, I shouldn't assume. When you travel, you go anywhere in the world and you find a church 
you're immediately family. It's incredible. You're part of this bigger thing. They don't even need to know your name. They don't even need to speak the same language. If they know you're a believer, you belong with them. You're part of this group. There are several ways that the Bible even talks about believers. And it calls us the people of God. It calls us the body, the temple or the building, the royal priesthood, the flock, the family, a holy nation, God's vineyard. You look at these descriptions of the church and the people of God and you realize that these are corporate images. These are group images. The very essence of the church is group, a gathering dynamic. The make of the church is a group. We are group. <laughs> Why are regular local gatherings essential for the believers? It's who we are. Is who we are. If you didn't get that last joke, just ask a teenager. <laughs> Next is the mission of the church. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says this, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to be observant of all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So here, this is called the Great Commission. It defines the mission that Jesus gave to all his followers, and it, the mission is to make disciples. And it's to be done of all people from all different nations, to baptize them and teach them to obey and to be aware of his presence. Now, a disciple is a student, a learner, and a follower. And we are to make those, we are disciple-making disciples of Jesus. The thing is, there are certain tasks. Uh, well, okay, there, there are multiple learning styles. Uh, when I was in college, I remember learning about three. Then I Googled it again, and there's like seven. I'm like, okay, well, forget that. There's a lot, there's a lot of learning styles now. Uh, and there's a variety of ways to learn certain things. But there are certain subjects that are more particular in how you have to learn them. We all know Thomas does jujitsu, as we heard today, and every weekend. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said I watched him the I know, I know, but you implied. We all know. We know what you meant. We know what you wanted to do. I'm just, I'm, I'm, we know. <laughs> and here's the thing. This, 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 is, this, is, this is not a strike against Thomas. I'm just pointing out that I could never beat Thomas at jujitsu just by watching TV, just by watching MMA, or reading a book on it, listening to podcasts, etc. right? Like, I would be in no condition. Uh, there are some things you learn by doing. So it is only after years and years and years of learning and practicing and exercising and sparring and training on the mat with other wrestlers that I could finally fight Thomas and still lose. <laughs> just, I gotta, be, I gotta speak the truth here. But the point that I have there is that some things have to be learned by doing with others. Even if you lose to Thomas. Discipleship is not something you can do by yourself. You cannot fulfill the mission of Jesus by yourself. You can't, <laughs> yeah, okay, so discipleship is done in relationship. You can't make new disciples if there are no people around, right? That's just you and your imaginary friends, like that's a problem. <laughs> Second is people are part of the process that bends and shapes and makes you more into the image of God. How many of you guys are annoyed by people? It's supposed to be that way because you're a terrible person and so are they, right? And it's only together do we grind off our, okay. So this is the way that Jesus modeled it for us. In John 20, 21, it says, Jesus spoke to them and said, be peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even I am sending you. Just as I came to you, I'm now asking you to go out to others. How did Jesus come? Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this the mind, 
among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who, though he was the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How Jesus showed us what it meant to truly live, what it meant to really be a human, he came and became a human, like us, lived like us. It says he was tempted in every way just as we are. He relied on the Spirit just as we have to. He gathered and he taught his disciples by doing life with them. And he died for humanity by humanity. See, nothing about Jesus and his mission says that he avoided people. This is how Jesus brought himself. Incarnationally, in the flesh, he came to us to relate with us. And he continues to do this through his body. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, it says this, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Here Paul is speaking and he is not saying, ooh, look at me, look at me, I'm so good. I'm better than you, which is kind of what I did. <laughs> uh, he's not saying that. Because at the beginning of the letter, he actually condemns people for bragging about who they follow. You know, I follow Apollos. I follow Paul. I follow Peter. I follow Jesus. You know, everyone's trying to one-up each other. And he says, that's not, that's not cool. That's not, that's, uh, that's not what we're about. But then later he says, now imitate me as I'm imitating Christ. It's almost like, are you going back on your word? No. What Paul is saying is that leaders need to imitate Christ so that others can have a physical representation of who Jesus is. The point isn't, isn't a matter of like, hey, look at me and see how good I am. The point is, I'm going to point you to Jesus. And if it means you have to look at me, then, you, then look at me. But I'm going to point you to Jesus. What this tells us is that Jesus is still discipling his people through his body, through us. Sometimes we are the Jesus that they have to see. In other words, it is through his body and his spirit that Jesus is still present to disciple with his people. We want to say, hey, it's just me and Jesus. I'm going to go home and have my private session. And Jesus says, I'm using my people. You're ignoring the avenue in which I have provided for you to be transformed into my likeness. Lastly, it is in our relationships. Well, lastly to this point. Sorry, Mark. Uh, <laughs> lastly, it is in our relationships that we grow in our Christ-likeness. Hebrews 10, 23-25 says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us. Let us do this. Let us do that. Let us encourage one another. Let us stir. This is a corporate Language. Together, it says, we hold fast to our confession. Together, we stir one another into Christ-like transformation. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. We need each other to grind off the rough edges, to point out our flaws and blind spots and sins, right? It's called a blind spot for a reason, because you can't see it. That's the point. You don't know if you have a blind spot. If you don't have any, you, you do. <laughs> we also have uh, what I call choose to ignore spots that need to be called out. Matthew 18, 15 through 20 is all about confronting one another, confronting each other in sin. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 is probably one of the most popular verses right now. Uh, it says, judge not that you be not judged. Right? We, like, we hear this all the time. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye and do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your, your eye when there is a log in your own eye? We often focus on the judge not portion of this passage. You know, judge not so you won't be judged. And we seem to ignore that the verse is not over. Verse 5. You hypocrite, 
First take out the log in your own eye, and then you will see clearly that there is no speck in your brother's eye. Is that what it says? Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It is not, the verse does not promote you do you, who am I to judge? That's often how it's used. It's actually addressing hypocrisy. It's not about not judging, but how do we properly, appropriately critique, judge one another? We don't leave specks in each other's eyes. That's not the point. We're not supposed to be speckled eyeball people. (laughs) But we do need to be intentional about how we address and aware of our own shortcomings. This should speak to our humility, not to our ability to withdraw and ignore problems. We should come with this, a sense of grace and understanding our own shortcomings and understanding that, yeah, I, I, I correct because I've also been corrected many times. The mission of Jesus is, and his followers is to make disciple-making disciples, and Jesus models it and continues to do it through community and through relationship. Now, different local churches structure differently. Uh, we can strategize on how we're going to do this. But for us at Rock Point, this regular local gathering is, an, is actually a very important hub of how we strategize for discipleship making. So being a part of this church, which I explain this all in the next step class, there's a little plug for you. Uh, this is a big part of our strategy is this gathering. This is the central hub. This is where it begins for us. And these times together, this is the start of our obedience to the command and the commission of Jesus. Like I said, not all churches do it this way. But if, you, if you're saying, hey, what does it look like to be a part of this community? We really value this. So again, you guys can get another gold star for being here. Why are regular gatherings essential for the believer? It's who we are. Next is the message of the church. The church has been entrusted by God with something that no other organization has. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right, we can try our best to copy everyone out, out there and be the most entertaining or flashy or whatever. But there's something that the church has that nobody else has. There's something that we offer that nobody else has. That's the gospel. The good news that salvation and reconciliation with God is available for anyone Everyone, regardless of age, race, gender, social status, they are all invited into the family of God. His love is for all people and is not limited by any demographic. The Great Commission says, go into all the nations. This is all people groups. Galatians 3, 27, 28, it talks about the unity. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, It's neither slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. This is saying is there is no barrier that can limit your access to Jesus. That's the truth of the gospel. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, for he himself is our peace, speaks of Jesus, who made us both, that is Jews and Gentiles, or Jews or non-Jews, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinance that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. I find it so interesting that a lot of friends and my, uh, people I know in my generation, they seem to want to run away from the church in light of the racial tensions because they, for some reason, the, they see the church is falling short in that. And there might be things we could do better, but I think it's so interesting is that in the middle of all of this racial tension, the gospel has not become outdated or old-fashioned. It's actually more relevant than ever. And I'm thinking everything that people are fighting for is what we've always believed. Maybe we haven't expressed it well enough. That's a different conversation. But that has not changed on what is core to the message of the gospel. It has always been about equality of all people. And that doesn't change. Every Sunday, we express the healing and the unifying power of the gospel by gathering together with people who, apart from this, we would never have crossed paths with. I mean, I know most of you wouldn't hang out with me. 
and this makes you. You have to. I, I have so many, the privileges of being not white, there are so many, I will not, I will joke, I will joke no more. I, watch it. Watch what, okay. This is the bloodline of Christ that ties us together. Don't you think that it's strange that we are a people who would proclaim this message of unity and then ignore the very people that we are reconciled with? How can we say we are people that God has brought all these groups together and we only meet with people that look and sound? It smell just like us? I don't know why smell is a thing. It's true. If someone really doesn't care for the community of God, I wonder if they've actually been transformed by the gospel. It should tell us we want to see the diversity and the differences. I want to see people who are not like me in different stages of life than me. Because it doesn't matter. We're all brought together in Jesus, and that is incredible. That's a unity that nothing else seems to be able to do. The gathering and coming in together in this unity and the celebration every week is at the heart of the gospel message. And we express that just showing up. Here's your third gold star. Just showing up, we express that unity. You're saying, I'm willing to be seen with this guy. <laughs> we express that. Why are regular local gatherings essential for the believer? It's who we are. My final point is to magnify God. This is probably the most important point. It's my favorite because the idea is it's not about you. We make it so much about us. And yes, Jesus saved you individually and cares for you individually and knows you intimately and individually, but he brought you in to be a part of what he is doing. These regular local gatherings are an essential rhythm of how we glorify God. In the Hebrew mindset, your day begins in the evening and it ends right before the, the evening of the next day. We see that in Genesis, all of Genesis 1. There's evening and morning the first day. You're like, that's weird. Well, that's how they thought. But this means that your day begins from a place of rest. Your, your day begins right before you go, you eat a meal and you go to sleep. That's, that's how your day starts. It's pretty awesome. It's almost like I guess it tells about your personality. I think it's awesome. Uh, but it's almost like the story of grace was woven within the very first pages of the Bible. How we begin from rest. On the seventh day, the one that marks the end of one week and the beginning of the next is a day of ceasing. Where we have the wonderful opportunity to remind ourselves regularly by ending our weeks ceasing from our work, and resting in the goodness of God. This is the way the Bible talks about our gatherings. You're ending your week and beginning the next. This is the hinge point, celebration of God. We remind ourselves of the gospel every week. We start from grace. We start from forgiveness and acceptance from God. We don't work to earn his favor. Coming here and starting your week this way should remind you that you're not working to earn God's approval. You are living out, moving out as one who is beloved, who is blessed, who is favored by God. We remind ourselves of this weekly to live in the way that God has made us. The story of grace. This also reminds us of God's sovereignty weekly by gathering here. Um, an Israeli scholar, uh, Matit Yahu Tzvat, he has a really cool quote when he talks about the way that the Israelites viewed their Sabbath. And he says, one day out of seven, the Israelite is to renounce dominion over his own time and recognize God's dominion over it. Simply put, every seventh day, the Israelite renounces his own autonomy and announces God's dominion over him. In conclusion, every seventh day, 
The Israelite renounces dominion over his time, his autonomy, and recognizes God's dominion over his time, and thus himself. Keeping the Sabbath is an acceptance of God's kingdom sovereignty. Keeping the Sabbath reminds us he is not just Lord of our lives, but even time itself, time which we are all subject to. He lords over that. Second, it is a time that we worship together. Uh, I have a story about um, uh, in college now. Uh, so you're watching me grow up. Look at that. And it was, uh, we, we have this thing on our Bible college called Dorm Warm. Those of you who have been in the Next Step class, you're privy to this, the secrets of this story. But uh, we have something called Dorm Warm where every year they pick a dorm and they kind of decorate it and we all meet there and we have sort of like a college party. Uh, it's a Bible college, so when you think college party, just throw Bibles into it, and that's what it is. Uh, and so this year, was, uh, it was Disney-themed, and there was a costume competition. And uh, needless to say, I won. Uh, <laughs> and I... Because <laughs> I, I... So I, it was Disney, and there's... My options are pretty low. When uh, you know what, I could dress up for Disney. But um, I'll just give you guys a clue of who who I came as. I don't know if you guys ever seen Up. <laughs> the only other Asian Disney character. I mean, I don't know why this is hard. But anyways, I won. Uh, and it was, it, the vote was done by cheers. And so there was me versus another person. And they're like, hey, cheer for who you want to win. And the, the lady goes up and she had like bought her costume. I made mine. But... <laughs> She bought hers, and they cheered for her. Yeah, whatever. But then I went up, and I kid you not, it was the most deafening. <laughs> this sounds so egotistical. But it was the most <laughs> deafening roar I've ever heard for myself. Just like the, the, the stone walls just like reverberated with people cheering for me. Like me. Like it was awesome. We weren't there for God. It was me at that moment. It was incredible. And I, I realized... So cheer for me after this, please. Uh, I realized, like, this is how people get addicted to, like, the rock star high. Like, I was contemplating changing my career. <laughs> it was so good. Like, do I really want to serve God? But I, I'm just kidding. But it was, I'm kidding. In this, what happened in this moment hit me. It was, like, how amazing and exciting and I, I believe that the Spirit saved me from my own ego because I felt God saying, is this not what I deserve? And I just thought, wow, that puts a whole new meaning to our gatherings. It holds a whole new meaning. There's, there, are, there are things that, there's ways that we can celebrate God that only really works in a group. Right? If you're on a stage and one person cheers for you, it just means you have a supportive mom. If you're, if you're doing, if, if you're, if you're doing a flash mob by yourself, you're just weird, right? Like, there are certain things that are done are better in groups. You know, it's, it's good to read your Bible. It's good to pray and sing songs, you know, by yourself or with a small group of people. But in a group, there's something that you just cannot do by yourself. Does not the God of the universe deserve that? The giver of life, giver of our very breath, our savior, our redeemer, does he not deserve the greatest outcry, the thing that we all long for when we want to be our rock stars and all that kind of stuff? Nobody deserves that kind of worship. But we, but we like to write it. Why? It feels good. Well, somebody deserves it. And it should be directed somewhere. There's power in the collective. A single drop of water versus a tsunami. A spark versus a wildfire, right? We see this even reflected in nature. Every week we have a chance to praise God in a way that you cannot do alone. The second part to worship is that the Bible actually has two main ideas when it describes the word worship. The first the most predominant one is it talks about to bow down or to kiss towards. And this speaks of adoration. 
So the most common word used in the Bible for, to describe worship, that we translate worship, is things of adoration. But the second most common idea tied with worship is the words work and serve. This involves acts of service towards God and his people. Do you realize that proper worship to God recognizes that our reverence towards him also responds in action? I think James said something about that. You need people in order to worship God by serving people. These regular gatherings are places where we get to serve God by serving one another. Right? All your precious little gremlins in the other room are being served because we have people who are worshiping God by taking care of them. The fact that I have a microphone, the media team, the worship team, people are worshiping God through their service. We get to worship God through their service. We get to worship God by serving one another. I'm going to ask the, uh, speaking of the worship team, I'm going to have them come up because I'm just about done. Look at that. Five points. You didn't think it'd be that fast. Louder. I'm just kidding. Um, no, stop, 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 stop. I got one more story for you guys, okay? Gosh, my, all my analogies are like based on my life because that's the only life I've observed really, you know? And it makes me feel like so egotistical. I did this, I did that. But I have another one thing about me, so here we go. I had the opportunity of, uh, I happened to be in... <laughs> I happen to be in Israel during Pentecost. Um, it's like, that's like not a flex to anywhere except in the church. <laughs> but I was, I, I had the privilege of being in Israel and it happened in Pentecost. And I, it was, so on that Sunday, we attended a service in Old City, Jerusalem, which is, is where the Old City or the ancient Jerusalem would have been or was. And I got to actually do that in the oldest Protestant church in Israel. So it was really an incredible experience. And gathered there, at that church were people from all around the world, different nations, different languages. We were all present at this tiny church, and it was a really powerful image of the reality of the outpouring of the Spirit 2,000 years ago. Like, I don't know if there's a better way to celebrate Pentecost and, like, being in Jerusalem with people from all around the world, being like, this is when it began, and the nations, like, were welcomed into the kingdom of God. It was just incredible. I, uh, we don't know the exact location of where Pentecost happened, where the upper room is, but we know enough to know that I was within a mile of where that place actually happened. It was incredible. Uh, so that experience was great, but honestly, the other thing I really noticed was how underwhelming it was. Like, I thought, like, you think all, everything is lining up. I'm in Jerusalem, like, the Jerusalem, on Pentecost, you know, maybe a stone's thrown away from the upper room, with believers from all around the world. And in that moment, there's something I realized. This feeling, this experience, the presence of God is the same there as it is here. I was like, it's, it's special, but it's not. Because the real evidence of the outpouring of the Spirit to the nations and to everywhere is that it's Everywhere. It's with us whenever we gather. Sometimes we forget about the privilege that we have in encountering the presence of God. We're not traveling halfway across the world on a special day just to encounter the presence of God. You show up, coffee in hand. Don't even do your hair. I'm not looking at anyone, right? But you just, <laughs> whatever, and boom, presence of God. Like, it's absurd. This is the privilege that we have. And this happens Every time we gather, God's desire has always been to dwell in the midst of his people. And every week we have the opportunity to encounter this reality. It is more than just a privilege, but it is also who God has made us to be. Why are regular local gatherings essential for the believer? It is who we are. Amen. 